Merriam-Webster's definition of beauty, the quality present in a thing or person that gives intense pleasure or deep satisfaction to the mind. Definition of pretty, pleasing or attractive to the eye. For me, authentic beauty goes beyond the surface, touches upon the meaning or substance of a thing or person. The question of beauty in art is a question I often contemplate when describing my own work. My intent has never been to create pretty pictures, pictures that match a couch. Most artists agree that if something has beauty, it should honestly and authentically also include its opposite. For an artist whose intention is to delve deeper into a subject or issue, the ugly needs to be present on some level as a counterpoint to the beauty portrayed. Not denying ugliness and being aware of it changes perception. Seeing, visualizing, feeling the ugly gives the beauty greater weight and meaning. As I create work in my studio, I go about it with little conscious intention. This may sound reckless and chaotic, but it is the only way I can get at the beauty and the ugly which lie deep inside my subconscious self. To draw out that truth, I must surrender all the cerebral mumbo-jumbo clogging my creativity. I must get out of my head. The beginnings of my work are often full of reckless abandonment, a free flow of color, movement, and shapes. That initial energy is liberating. Then I freeze. What am I going to do next? The work is incomplete, but I don't want to ruin what I have so far. Many nights I laid in a mummy position, hands across my chest and pillows on each side of me for support. My breath slow and deliberate as I contemplated the roller coaster ride we were on with our 21 year old daughter. It was January 2016 and she asked us on a moment's notice to meet her in the therapist's office. It was there she broke the news that she had been self-medicating her anxieties and depression using alcohol. My daughter chose a neutral and supportive environment in which to fundamentally alter our world in a matter of five minutes. We were stunned. After all was revealed, my spouse asked matter-of-factly, can you quit drinking? My daughter said, sure. So for the next six months, we continued to deny the depth of her addiction. We were naively committed to confronting this problem privately. Meanwhile, our daughter continued her self-imposed isolation, rarely leaving her room except to go to her car for reasons unknown to us then, but later evident. When she began complaining of stomach issues, she went to my doctor who could only advise further tests. This was April. And as time went on, she ate less and less, looked frail, and the whites of her eyes began to appear yellow. We reminded her frequently to get the test done. She chose not to go. She was 21. I think she was terrified. I know I was. As the weeks passed, the weight of denial hovered over our household. I often woke up in the middle of the night wondering if she would be alive the next morning. Finally, one June morning, I woke up with the resolve to get her to the clinic even if I had to drag her into the car. I went through my usual routine, read the newspaper, jolted my brain with strong coffee. I marched into her room and said, I'm taking you to the clinic, be ready in an hour. Her father agreed. The car ride was one of both relief and impending despair. I sat in the back in an aura of nervous energy. Her dad seemed his calm, cool, and collective self. As a physician, he has had years of experience dealing with patients and their families, but his own daughter's fragile health was uncharted territory. My mind was roiling. How did we get to this point? Why the hell were we not able to prevent any of this from happening? And then we were there. 
From the urgent care clinic, our daughter was sent to the emergency room. This was when all the truth bombs hit us like meteors. I wanted to cry. I wanted to scream. I wanted to hit someone. I had to leave the room. Alcoholic hepatitis. Her liver was not functioning. A transplant might be necessary, but she would have to be alcohol free for six months. Six months. My daughter was barraged with a series of questions about her drinking. She was defiant, giving short, angry answers. As the night wore on, her answers became more truthful. For the next five days in the hospital, I was the emotional comfort figure. My spouse played the collaborative health care role with her medical team. My daughter moved past the drama that first night in the ER to where a transplant was not necessary. Her physical health was slowly improving. But the dizzying roller coaster ride was just getting fired up. In the many months, now years, since the first trauma, I have learned that substance use is a family affair. I have also learned that stigma is a barrier to recovery. As my daughter Mackenzie suffers through her addiction, her recovery, her relapses, I have tried to allow the faith I have in my daughter to override the hideous characteristics of what this disease has done to her. Being an artist is not what I do, but who I am and how I approach my environment each day. Life events weigh heavily in my subconscious. That last sentence in the video, then I freeze, what to do next? I don't want to ruin what I have so far. In my art, I know that this crisis point is when I must dig deeper and that it won't necessarily be pretty. Part of the process may be to obliterate much of what's in front of me to achieve the depth of meaning I want. It could get ugly, chaotic, and messy. But this is the most vital part of my work. It is the absolute reason why I create. The love-hate relationship with the piece begins here. When I hit that subconscious nerve, it becomes important to not make judgments. This moment is not the result of a mistake. Rather, it is a moment of recognition and an opportunity for growth. To avoid analyzing or projecting what should happen next, I must stop, put the work aside, live with the ugly. I am not an expert on addiction or recovery, but I know that for me to walk in the beauty of my life and work, I must learn to recognize the connectedness of everything that is me. Appreciating and embracing the unpleasantness is a vital part of the walk. I cannot freeze and search for fault or try to recover the pretty. Pretty is gone. Maybe it never was. Maybe there's nothing to be recovered but much to be discovered and celebrated. So I paint the slashing brown stroke, the bold yellow, the delightful runaway drip of heavy blue, the sudden burst of golden light, the wild roiling, the meticulous shadow, my tools of recovery, my reflections on meaning, seeds of hope. The act of embracing my beautiful daughter.